Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice is a third-person psychological thriller independent AAA title created and published by Ninja Theory in 2017. It tells the story of Senua, a picked warrior in the late 8th century who is also a sufferer of psychosis, searching to redeem the soul of her dead lover from Viking Hell. Hi, my name is Micah and I'm a big boy. Regardless, its development team was rather small in comparison to a traditional AAA studio, yet shared similar design goals and wanted to deliver a AAA quality game with a focus on telling a brilliant emotional story about Senua and investigate psychosis through the gaming medium. Today I'm going to be critiquing this game or to offer a think piece on the game depending on how you look at it. Either way, it will be full of spoilers. I feel no shame in admitting this is a very difficult game to approach and a difficult game to critique because it deals with some very serious themes, themes which are potentially very important to the people who play it or the people who may see this video. I've been a bit concerned that I may not be qualified to offer comment on the game simply because of its focus on mental illness, but I hope you understand the conclusion I've come to regarding this. I'd like to contribute to the discourse surrounding this game, and I believe that I have done my best to understand the developer's intentions behind creating it. I truthfully respect the experience of anyone who has played it and has their own thoughts. It's not my intention to speak about mental illness in this video, it's to talk about the game Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. Mental illness is a feature of this game, so naturally I do comment on it from time to time, but I am not a psychologist. I'm simply speaking about what I found in this game which represents mental illness and whether I thought it was a good game or not. On a less serious note, if we're going to acknowledge and respect the accessible external knowledge on Hellblade to inform my opinion and critique of the game, why don't we also count my external experience of having played a few hours of Max Payne 3? Basically, that means that I've played other games that have lens flares and hallucinations before, they're not exactly uncommon, and maybe I had thoughts on them back then as well. So, what I'm trying to say is, Hellblade's contextualization of what I feel are its particular shortcomings, intentional choices or not, does not make them somehow critically immune. These lens flares might be annoying all the same, just like I thought they were in Max Payne 3. This is a critique of Hellblade's Senuous Sacrifice, and I hope you enjoy. Valraven, ancestor of the seers and master of ravens. He hunts his prey with his powers of illusion and feasts on their remains. Follow the path to Valraven and defeat him in battle to earn his mark. The gate to Helheim cannot be opened without it. Let's talk about the gameplay first. Most of the questing in the game has to do with forward progression. You move through an environment to leave the environment to get closer to a goal, which is usually set up for you either in a small way or a big way. The small way might be unlock this door, and the big way might be save Dillian's soul. Senua's Sacrifice contains a wide variety of linear environments, including beaches, small islands, the interior of a ship, and forests of different varieties. They all look spectacular, the lighting in particular. Senua traverses through the environments by walking or with a light jog. The animations look fantastic given some really great motion capture here, and throughout her goals or objectives are always very clear. They often have to do with simply reaching the end of the current environment. Hellblade fills out these locations with light puzzles and combat. Let's talk about the puzzles first. Let me set the scene for you. You enter an environment and are naturally drawn toward the exit, which is a straight shot ahead of you. You take note of the surrounding area and a path or two that you may be able to take. When you reach the exit, you realize the door is sealed and you are unable to to progress without first investigating the environment for the rune to unlock the door or construct the path needed to progress. You walk away from the exit to reassess the whole room and find the rune which is hidden within the architecture of the environment. The game will block your path and force you to walk along specific paths in a specific order which might change the environment to allow you access to new areas afterward. You navigate through the linear level in this way and you find the rune hidden in the architecture. At some point enemies will appear and you must defeat them in combat to continue. You scan the rune and reapproach the exit walking back through the linear environment to reach the door. You open the door and move on. I have just described, simplistically but nonetheless accurately, the structure of Hellblade's environments and gameplay both on a miniature and large scale. Approach the door, find it is locked, walk back through the environment in the specific order the puzzle requires, Leap. Is it exploration if there are such strongly guided paths I must take? Moreover, is it interesting across the seven hours of game when the only changes to the formula are visual? For example, walking through Val Ravin's Illusion Forest asks you to pay attention to the environment and walk through the right illusory gates in the right order to unlock the door. 
The nighttime section much later on asks you to pay attention to sound, control of vibration and the environment to move through a world you can't see very well. Both are separate and different enough instances on their own, but the approach the player is required to apply to both challenges is nearly identical and that is move with the left stick. Chased by a beast, escaping a fire, a puzzle room, following a light across a beach, all you'll really be doing is moving with the left stick. This wouldn't have been so obvious and wouldn't be a problem if what was happening around Senua wasn't of such variety. Sometimes the screen will distort and the environment will change drastically, put the player in a position that appears genuinely frightening, but all they ever do in response to it is move forward with the left stick. As a result, the tension of the situation apparent visually, risks not engaging the player and appearing melodramatic or reliant on shock value. If I can only respond to a prompt in a certain way, my own emotional reactions could be limited or repetitive. Furthermore, I was disappointed by the lack of danger in the puzzles and the environments. Senua can pass as a result of smoke inhalation or other things, but the punishment is minimal and easy to avoid. While paying attention to the environment is needed to complete puzzles, the player rarely has to put their observational skills in a way that might protect them. You just aren't allowed to walk off a ledge. So sometimes the environments just don't feel like environments or like a world. They feel like cardboard boxes with safety rails. I've heard that this particular mechanic of runes and of seeing things and making mental connections is a symptom of psychosis. It's included in the behind the scenes footage, and to that end it's a clever inclusion. Clever, however, does not justify its constant overuse. Any thematic point this mechanic might have been serving has been served by the second or third time. I don't think this is as far as they could have taken the idea of mental connections and constructions on a mechanical basis, and I'm not certain this is the only element of psychosis they could have made into a mechanic. I can understand the desire to keep environments linear to control gameplay elements at its most basic form a puzzle is indeed just doing things in a specific order to figure things out but quite a lot of Hellblade feels a little bit too similar to a checklist someone wrote down that the player just happens to be following. Here are all of the different puzzle stages in the game and I'll briefly go through the base mechanics of each. Valraven, Cert, Bridge to Helheim, Nighttime, Torch House, Nighttime Daytime, The Swamp, Underground, Hellheim. Now there are some clever spins on the idea of reusing the environments which make them a little easier to swallow given the alterations and lighting changes but the movement across them is mostly simple and I can't ignore how frequently this idea is used and often how simple the alterations themselves are. These nighttime daytime switching masks are effectively identical to the illusory gates used in the Valraven stage and the swamp. They simply affect more of the stage at one time when triggered. As for the changes themselves across all of these stages it's sometimes a door being blocked by a tree or a plank being located somewhere where it wasn't before and it's not very interesting and sometimes feels cheap. Occasionally the player will notice some environmental fracturing which they'll need to observe from the correct angle to realign the pieces and I think this could easily be classified as another illusory gate type mechanic given that the player needs to navigate to a specific point before the environmental change is made and it results in an environmental change. The biggest difference is that the change is permanent. The underground section I thought on the whole was fairly strong in terms of puzzles but in reality it's very similar to Cert's fire trial just kind of in a reverse way. The player has to run between set points to reach safety and find the runes within the same stage simultaneously essentially making their way through each environment twice once at their own pace in safety and once while in danger. The most major change is that the player controls when the fire will start in Cert's trial activating the danger for themselves and underground the torch is used as a way for them to activate the safety instead. This particular stage here at the end of the swamp has this same uh, running from danger style thing but it feels unique in the game because it's the only time where the player is running from something where they feel they are able to choose where they run with some amount of freedom instead of along a predetermined path or between two set points. It's also the only running moment in a stage they haven't visited before that has some kind of complex construction. This is probably my favorite moment of gameplay in the game exactly because 
because of these reasons and feels like the most tense and dangerous of these running situations exactly because of these reasons. Just a little bit more freedom over the gameplay elements makes that much more difference. The nighttime section is the only stage with patrolling enemies that apparently require timing to avoid, but it is without a secondary gameplay element to complement it. You're simply moving forward, whereas these other stages often have you moving forward while looking for something. There's this one part in the torch house where you walk around and light torches that is probably a puzzle, but I used mere guesswork and stumbled through it without needing to apply thought to it at all. It uses the by now stale idea of walking out of a room into the room you just left, but I'm unable to piece together what's actually going on here. This is probably the weakest moment in the game. Maybe it's trying to teach you about the lighting lanterns for use later on, but I think it's mostly a story focused section or to introduce you to the idea of the trials of Odin. So if we break it down, there are only a handful of twists the game ever applies on top of the rune doors, which it merely frames in slightly different ways, which are as follows. Illusory gates, which alter the environment for a puzzle, running from danger with a kind of safety environment twist, and a single use of patrolling enemies. I think this will press my case that there appear to be gentle shifts of gameplay when in fact most puzzle devices used in the game, including the rune doors, boil down to guiding and restricting where the player will walk and in what order they must move through the environment to solve a problem. So on top of the only response to the game's prompts often afforded to a player being movement, the game strictly dictates how they may apply that response to the prompt as well. This is paired with the game's already strictly linear level design. I'm unsure about how the atmosphere is supposed to remain intact when it is always so plainly obvious what the player will be doing when something happens, as well as where they'll have to be doing it. Despite how dark and uncomfortable the game is on the surface, it never really forces you to do anything uncomfortable. And the dictation of movement speed is a way for the game to place the player's input secondary to the desired visuals and atmosphere, instead of allowing the player to act freely within the atmosphere and respond of their own volition. It's difficult to feel like I, as a player, am experiencing something when everything feels so stringent. If you're an optimist, it's a way to help less experienced gamers have as smooth and involved an experience as possible, and if you're a cynic, it might feel a little like Ninja Theory gives you no freedom because they really don't want you messing this up. I think there's also a lot of instances of Hellblade's puzzle teaching you the base mechanic through one use, then having the player use it in a slightly more intensive way, but I'd like to have been surprised by changes and sudden mechanics more often. It's not as if any of these mechanics are particularly difficult to piece together in the first place, so I think simply throwing out the introduction once or twice might have added to the mystery or impact of each element a bit more. There's also the reality that the game doesn't really explain how the doors are locked by the runes, just that they are. I don't think it's a major issue, but I would have liked some different kinds of tasks to complete, because the rune doors happening again and again gets me thinking about repetition, which then has me realize that a lot of the rest of the game is repetitive too. I think it's important for me to mention that there isn't anything strictly speaking wrong with the puzzles in Hellblade. They just don't feel inspired or capturing, but when looking back it's difficult not to feel underwhelmed by some of the opportunities that they they might have missed. I think the interactivity of the hallucinations themselves should have been pushed a lot harder, but for now let's get on to the combat. I like this combat. It's tense and fresh when facing a single foe. Its moveset is easy to understand, but complex enough to make boss battles feel involved. It looks fantastic, visually it's engaging. Perhaps it would be more accurate to say I like this combat in isolation. If you change the sword to a lightsaber, have a couple of different stances and movesets, and some more flesh on the bones of the block parry mechanic, finally somebody did Jedi combat right. But as far as its use in Hellblade goes, I really like the single foe fights. They're definitely the highlights of the game, engaging on a control and visual level, and while the shapes of arenas needed to be very specific, there's a sense of occasion to it that the rest of the game doesn't boast. I particularly liked the beast fight and its use of lights and controller vibration. Each of the fights could be more polished, but the single foe encounters are quite good, and I can easily see a full game being made using a slightly more evolved version of this kind of system with a bunch of different bosses. But for the multi-foe encounters, the vast majority of fights, I can't be so generous. Ninja Theory must have played enough Ocarina of Time to know how frustrating it is for a player to fight multiple foes at once with a combat system that requires a lock-on. Hellblade chooses to bring the camera in super tight as well, which doubles the problem. You can't really see anything, you can't really react in time, there's often an overload of information. The only kinds of enemies that are added later in the game to spice things up are just clones of bosses that you've already fought and defeated, and the lack of clarity 
in regards to damage taken and damage dealt is quite frustrating. This guy right at the start can't kill you for example. I've no way of proving this but it feels like a perfect example of the heads up display or lack of heads up display being used against the player. The game might up an enemy's damage output to falsify tension and you might never know. Sometimes you'll go down in one hit sometimes more. Like I said I have no way of proving this is a feature but it certainly feels unfair when it shouldn't. The amount of hits enemies can sustain before falling is difficult to grasp and Ninja Theory is so aware of all this frustration that the final encounter of the game is to intentionally exploit the system's shortcomings to force you to lose. This would be very cool if it didn't feel identically annoying to most of the previous fights. It felt so similar to me because this kind of thing had been asked of me so many times before that the game had to verbally instruct me to give up. I don't think the multi encounters are broken or anything but they play in the total opposite direction to what I feel are the combat system's strengths. The timing of dodges, the balance of charge, and the timing associated with meeting an opponent of matched skill. These enemies stalk to you incredibly slowly, have very limited move sets themselves. Later on there are these two guys who move at completely different speeds to the other enemies and just don't match. So the flow of each fight gets harder and harder to feel and it gets harder to enjoy the skill because the fights get busier and longer over the course of the game. The animations look heavy but you're expected to be mashing the dodge button to swiftly dodge all of these weighty swords and it doesn't visually match. When facing a boss it feels like an entirely different system, like an even fight, a duel of sorts, where enemies retreat as often as you do and they're also contextualized by story which is kind of crucial. But I think the combat on whole, while it partly feels like it was designed to placate impatient people, is simultaneously the most valuable and wasted system in the game. Its effectiveness tapers off well before its most important uses due to thin contextualization and a seemingly vast misunderstanding of itself. The symbolism it implies to do with Senua fighting her own nature is, like the other mechanics in the game, used as often as possible to beyond overkill, to the point where it feels like it devalues what occasions it is effective in retrospect. If the number of these fights had been substantially decreased I'd be far more impressed by both the system and their larger symbolic nature in the story but as it stands the system is used at far too many disposable times. There was a lot more value in this combat than its overuse implies. I have a theory about this and it ain't good. There is a problem born from the incompatibility between Vikings and Psychosis. While there is a single television show which depicts Vikings in a supposedly historically accurate way I haven't seen seen past episode 3 and I can't imagine everyone who plays the game to be able to depend upon the relatability or familiarity of the Viking setting. So if Vikings are an alien fictional landscape to many players and Psychosis is also, the devs are trying to introduce two very rare types of story at the same time. They also need to include features and mechanics for both, hence the combat. This means that they've given themselves a big task to introduce and expand on both aspects fully in a way that anybody could understand, but they don't because Hellblade is quite limited in scope and is trying to intertwine the two so directly. You kind of need to know one to know the other. This is a story about psychosis in the settings context. A game just about Vikings saying all of these darkness elements and hallucinations are a kind of Viking magic instead of mental illness I think would have gone down unquestioned, especially given that the game itself beyond a pre-title screen warning never clearly irrefutably states mental illness is a feature it is exploring. It's constantly referred to as darkness or curse or other such interchangeable terms. I wouldn't be surprised if someone who goes into the game totally blind three or four years from now has no idea that psychosis specifically is what they were trying to explore. And given the fantasy vibe and the gaming landscape, I'm going to say my first unguided thought will go to magic instead of mental illness in a game about people with swords. Either of these elements would be compelling on their own, Vikings and psychosis, but if I had to pick which one I am more interested in, in seeing being adapted, it's definitely psychosis, and I think Ninja Theory might agree. I know it's a strange criticism to make and not at all a realistic one to say this game would have been better if it wasn't Vikings, but I don't believe it's false. I think a more mundane setting that a wider number of people can relate to and understand would have made a lot more room for the psychosis elements to stand out. I was continuously questioning what were the hallucinations and what was just a part of the Viking setting, because the game can't draw clear lines between two unclear, unfamiliar 
things, and I ultimately lost track of what was happening. The solution to this is kind of found in the lore stones, which tell you more about Viking history, which on my first playthrough I chose to ignore. The ability to choose to accidentally confuse yourself might be a bit of a misstep in a narrative focused game. If this setting is your focus and the story takes place strictly within that setting and its societal structures, I think a little more clarity would have gone a long way. If a more modern setting was utilized, the story would be able to speak about mental illness directly, create characters based on current social stigmas, and spend less time decorating the environments with bodies and more time surprising the player within circumstances that might feel similar to their everyday life. Hellblade is a very cinematic game. The lighting effects vary across the game, the assets used look fantastic in motion, and the screen effects are compelling and unique. This, along with the fantastic audio design, is Hellblade's way of conveying psychosis. These are the impressions of symptoms that the dev team estimated after talks with sufferers and experts that they've implemented into the game sequences and levels. It's meant to make the player feel as if they are experiencing these symptoms, seeing things that aren't there, feel out of place, doubting everything they see. Some of these distortions are visually excellent, and when they work, they really work. They particularly convey a sense of speed quite well when the player is in control. However, the more you pay attention, the more you'll notice that the hallucinatory visuals and the sounds of the voices are tied to Senua moving through specific areas, not tied to her specifically. You're not really going to get a you like to play Castlevania moment in Hellblade, something that freaks you out because it's real, targeted at you. Senua does not perceive changes or hear things isolated to herself, it's triggered by the environment. This gives a weird out of place feeling that there's actually something going on with the world, not with her head, and while psychosis is a reality bending condition the reality only bends in specific moments in specific ways. There was a unique opportunity to make every playthrough slightly different by experiencing wildly different kinds of symptoms of the illness during different stages of the game. Randomizing the effects to reflect the variety of ways people can suffer from the illness, make it feel alive. This would be more in line with the perception of reality than reality itself. There could have been, I might argue should have been, a much greater emphasis placed on the voices reacting to the character actions in real time. They do so in combat a little, but I think this needed to be a prevalent haunting feature. The voices know what you're doing and they're talking about it, but what does happen in the game is when I attempt to open this door, a major plot point, the voice reactions are mostly completely vague. It's unfortunate that these reinforce scripted actions and events, leaving very little sense of intimacy between the voices and the player. The only instance I found of the kind of reaction I was looking for was right at the very start of the game, when I chose not to move the camera. Can you see them? Over there. Why isn't she looking? <laughs> Why aren't you looking? Isn't and it was a singularly chilling moment. I would have liked to have heard more specific reactions to more specific things I can do as a player, even just a player controlled ability to sheathe or draw your sword, which the voices react to when you use and more opportunities to make subtle choices based on what I was shown or told. I find it a little confusing, if I'm honest, that the player is given the option to decide some things in the game, like which god to kill first, or which gate to look through first, but not to make a spur of the moment choice based on a hallucination or some information that may not actually be real. Making the player think story actions through and use their own brain to try and decipher the psychotic world would have made a lot of sense, really would have had players guessing what was real by making them act on it to story ramification. Despite how well done a lot of these visual effects are, their scripted nature makes them bluffs that are easy to call on the player's behalf, but their actions in-game are restricted to disallow such initiative. If the ending is riffing on the idea of accepting the illness, I think making that an option in gameplay to slow down, try and figure out what's real and what's not, could have been an interesting feature. I think this might have been an ideal way to use Dillian's head, which you carry, as a gameplay feature. Senua occasionally holds their head to give herself comfort or guidance during cutscenes, so if the player had had the option to hold the head in their hands and calm down, focus on a lesson Dillian taught 
Senua to breathe and find the help she needs, that could have been an interesting way to make the world and hallucinations more reactive. It would also make losing his head later on a much bigger deal, and make Senua's peaceful decision to move on at the very end of the game a bit more impactful. Regardless of what exact function it achieved, I really think Dillian's head should have been a gameplay feature. Either way, the hallucinations should react, move, present more threats, and different kinds of threats, more dialogue as well, depending on what the player is doing, instead of triggering at the beginning and end of a sequence by moving through the world. It's all environmentally focused, isolated to scripted times, and dependent on scripted or strongly encouraged actions, and I think this makes it easy not to be sucked in by. If the player doesn't have to play a long for it to feel real, you've done your job a lot better. Now, I assume the idea of none of this is real, so all of it is psychosis, whether things are happening or not, will act as a counter argument for my criticisms here. First of all, if all of this is fake, where should I find the impact in the game or its story if all of it is fake and me knowing that from the start? For example, I like the scarecrow sections in Batman Arkham Asylum because they come from nowhere and are fresh departures from the style of the majority of the game. They feel like hallucinations because they are different from something else. I like the Templar storyline and its hallucinations in Dragon Age Inquisition, because it comes from nowhere and links back to reality in a very satisfying way, and because the events depicted inside that hallucination are distorted replays of game events that I've already been witness to. I like Spec Ops The Line for many reasons, but partly because it's a horrifying descent from an acceptable reality to a terrifying realization of that reality, mirroring the player's own choices and progression. In order to create impact, there has to be contrast between what's real and what's not. So if all of it is fake, that causes more problems than it solves. And how the player draws their own lines between reality and projection is a part of gaming I find very interesting, so I would have liked to see Hellblade really pull this off, especially given that its hallucinations are inspired by the kinds that people experience in real life. A possible way to have improved its ability to do this would have been to market it as a normal Viking game with these psychosis elements being a twist that only players would know during the game, or to have the player participate in or bear witness to some normality which contrasts against Senua's reality. What if there's an intense argument between her and the voices going on, and the camera slowly pulls away, the voices slowly fade into silence to show you her arguing with nobody, just for a moment, to see how she looks to someone else and let the reality of of her inner torment really hit home. That slow reveal is what it's all about. It's the switch from normality to a subjective reality, the growth and shift between what you think is happening to what is really happening, where the real delicacy lies and where the real impact comes from. Anybody who likes Undertale or Doki Doki Literature Club can give you a seminar about it, but unfortunately Hellblade missed this train. I think overall, despite being narrative focused, Hellblade's gameplay has some serious issues in focusing itself on the narrative. Maybe I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but if a story is the central feature of the game, and the gameplay is simply there to be there, some priorities might be out of place. And it doesn't need to be solved by creating open worlds, or ironing out the combat, or more puzzle mechanics. It comes from creating your gameplay and your story with central goals in common, and Hellblade's gameplay doesn't seem to share the most important goals with the story. With that said, let's get to the narrative. Stormy seas and lost souls. She's dreamt of this before. They say dreams are visions of our memories, thoughts and fears, as seen by our inner eye. But what if each one of us is always dreaming, even when awake, and we only see what our inner eye creates for us? Is this what hell is? A world shaped by Senua's nightmares? Maybe that's why people feared seeing the world through her eyes. Because if you believe that Senua's reality is twisted, you must accept that yours might be too. You fail the gods. You're pathetic. Rotten. Cursed. What were you thinking? Did you really think you could win? How stupid can you be? Everyone hates her. She's a curse. Look at you, a warrior, <laughs> worthless, weak, pathetic, go on, feel sorry for yourself, 
because there's no one left to do that for you. The story of Hellblade Senua's sacrifice revolves around Senua, a picked warrior suffering from psychosis on a quest to rescue the soul of her lover Dillian. Let me recap the whole story for you right now just to get some context. Senua, a daughter of a religious zealot and a woman who suffers from psychosis, begins to see her mother fall victim to ravings, which her father takes to be a curse. She watches her father burn her own mother at the stake, which makes Senua's own psychosis noticeably worse. As Senua grows, her father, the head of the clan, more or less kept her imprisoned in their home and abused her, made sure she knew her illness was a curse. She was a lonely soul who, upon seeing a traveling warrior present in her village, introduced herself to this boy. This is Dillian, the son of another clan's chieftain, and Dillian and Senua fall in love. Senua rebels against her father and frees herself from his abuse to be with Dillian and his clan. Even while she is with him, she is weighed down by the notion that her darkness, as her father had taught her, will infect and kill those she comes close to, including Dillian. A plague kills many in his tribe, including his father, leaving Dillian as the chieftain. Blaming herself for the plague, she exiles herself to a forest to try and rid herself of the curse and of any misfortune that might follow her as a result of it. During this exile, she encounters Druth, a former slave of the Vikings, who tells her many stories of their gods and customs. Upon returning to the tribe, she finds them massacred by Vikings and Dillian strung up as a sacrifice to their gods. Upon witnessing this aftermath, Senua's mind essentially breaks. She envisions a journey into Viking hell informed by the stories Druth told her. She wants to face and kill their gods head on and save Dillian's soul from supposedly eternal damnation as a result of his sacrificial murder. She goes through the ups and downs of the journey, fighting her darkness through the quest, before coming to terms with her loss and accepting Dillian's passing, leaving her old self behind and finally accepting her darkness. I think before I give my take on the story, it's important for me to recognize that the story is the game's focus. I think the story has resonated with a lot of people, which is always something to celebrate, and I'm glad many have had positive experiences of this story. Having said that, I have a few questions for those of you who've played the game, maybe even specifically those who liked the game and its story. Could you tell me what Dillian's character flaws are? Could you tell me Zinbel's redeeming qualities? Could you tell me who Zinbel was? Could you tell me at what time Dillian and Senua's relationship was developed and their courtship elaborated on? Could you hypothetically give me a few important quotes from the game, moments of dialogue that stood out, and could you tell me what psychosis is? I think these last two are the most important ones. Can you tell me what the writing in this game sounds and feels like, and do you know how to succinctly define the game's central feature based on no knowledge but that which the game itself provides you? According to ReachOut.com, psychosis is a term used to describe a number of psychological symptoms that impact on a person's understanding or perception of reality. Psychosis is a descriptive term for many unpredictable, undefinable, often inexplicable hallucinations and mental states. Sometimes people hear voices, sometimes their vision is altered, sometimes they come to mental conclusions which can't be justified rationally. All of these and more are demonstrated in Hellblade. Psychosis appears to be a very useful storytelling tool for a game because there are kinds of common symptoms which are replicable in an interactive form on which Ninja Theory have done their research, but also because there are no apparent boundaries within that definition. It's very easy to pin hearing voices on psychosis as it is to to enemies who you fight, as well as an entire hallucinated environment based on the illness, since the illness could be, theoretically, anything. It seems to be a catch-all term for anything that the designers might want to place in their game. It's very easy to bend your rules when you never define them and you don't really have any. My other question concerning the writing is a little more abstract. When a game uses voiceover this heavily, it does need to have a fair bit of dialogue, so I understand that not every moment is going to be crazy excellent writing. For the record, I quite like the story itself. I think it's fine, good. The metaphors of the inner struggle is interesting and the ideas put forth by the narrative and its characters are more than possible they're good, but it's completely undersold by the way it's written. There are three major problems I find with the writing in Hellblade. The first is the terminology. It uses a lot of easily confusing, interchangeable terms like darkness or curse for the mental illness, which are common terms in cross fiction in general, but they're overused to the point of numbness in Hellblade. Darkness appears to be used to refer to Senua's condition, the state of the world, the beast that chases you through the underground, which actually does have a name, the voice in Senua's head which belongs to the beast, the rot, what Zinbel 
Giselle inflicts upon her. It doesn't choose its words wisely, is what I mean. It's very simple language, and doesn't often appear to be reflective of the time period apart from what things are called or named. It doesn't sound as though it comes from another time, way back in the 8th century when the story is based. So there's a loss of identity there. When every character in Hellblade refers to so many things all in relation to Senua with the same term, darkness, it's hard to find the difference between characters. My second major problem with the writing is its emotionally stringent nature. This problem is twofold, reinforced by the game's insistence on repetition and its apparent refusal to trust its actors. To his soul. It won't open. How will she get through? Why won't it open? Why can't she open it? She needs to challenge the gods. She yeah, there's a fight. lot of this. I understand the game's voices, their presence absolutely, but as far as their actual function goes, it's constricted to step-by-step -step quest information or tiny little pieces of story, both of which they will repeat until they make absolutely certain you get the picture and know exactly how you should feel about it. This is what I mean by repetition, and it ensures that not only will the player be babied through most of the questing, but the story will be spoon-fed to them at exactly the right pace, with exactly the right emotional spin, and allow them very little room for a personal reaction or the freedom of interpretation. I also don't feel that the player becoming annoyed with the voices is the desired reaction, since the characters themselves, including Senua, often and repeat information like this ad nauseum. And if the voices were there to specifically annoy you, I think it would be far more obvious. They wouldn't help you in combat, they would hinder you. There wouldn't be opportunity for extended silences because sometimes they're gone for levels at a time. They wouldn't only trigger again at scripted times to relay simple quest information that you already know. And there wouldn't be a volume slider to turn down just vocals. The dialogue would also have been more carefully weighed against the intention of the current quest and matched to ample amplify each other instead of cancelling each other out. But at current, the voices repeating what you need to do acts as more of like a comfort, a confirmation of objective and a dispelling of the quest's tension and mystery by acting in the way it does. Every time they say Senua will fail, it becomes easier and easier to ignore. There simply wouldn't be the opportunity to tune them out, given that looping ambient conversation is fairly common in games, especially RPGs. I mean, I've completed Arkham Knight, bro. No matter how many times you repeat candid conversation, I'm used to this kind of thing. This doesn't bother me, it disrupts the game and dispels tension and atmosphere. And what I mean by the game's refusal to trust its actors, would you like to see a clip of some great game writing that does trust its actors? Here we go. Don't tell me how much Senua loves Dillian, make me feel that way about him. Don't force Druth's origin story out of nowhere just to fill up a gameplay moment and explain his character when I didn't care about him anyway. Don't tell me for the 15th time in a cutscene that Senua is afraid of something. Hold back, give your characters some depth, tell the story through restraint. This particular clip here had me nearly pulling my hair out. It's a minute and a half sequence involving a sword lodged into a tree. I've just lost my sword and could probably use a replacement. I have just seen Senua very upset about this development. The voices are telling me I need the sword. The voices are telling me I should take the sword. Senua is trying to take the sword. Druth tells her about the sword, saying it's incredibly powerful, forged by Odin. Senua then says aloud, I need the sword. It's important. Just to take the past couple of minutes, stick him in a nutshell, and whack me over the head with how dumb I am that I couldn't figure it out on my own. It's the expository equivalent to a Donald Trump tweet. It feels like it needs to say absolutely everything that could be said in any moment and leaves nothing to subtext. This makes everything but particularly characters appear thin, like it was written by someone who has no idea how people talk, or someone who mistakes symbolism, inference, and poetry for shoving their story ideas down a player's throat instead of inviting them inside. This current writing is not engrossing. This is what I mean by emotionally stringent. The writing will bump you over the head with something obvious several times until the player is unable to make up their own reaction to an event, which will be causing too much of a headache to realize that it's without much depth all the same. My third problem with the writing is that it lacks traditional detail with its characters, leaving a decidedly bare impression of all the characters other than Senua, who seems to enjoy flipping back and forth between absolute despair and mouth 
frothing rage quite a bit. Much could be made of Hellblade's lack of tutorials if there wasn't one on the pause menu and the character of Druth wasn't used as a means to act as a tutorial himself. He, as a character, is there to explain mechanics such as focus, the rune doors, and pieces of Viking history not to be a character as such. For example, the player may choose to undertake Val Raven's trial or Surt's trial first in either order makes little difference to how each trial plays out barring the types of enemies in combat. This means that Druth will explain how a rune door works in both trials despite the fact he's already explained it before the player could undertake either. His own plot essentially tapers off after these mechanics have been explained, popping up less and less often to explain or introduce some things, lending sense to his presence only as a tutorial or an expository device. But the particular writing that I found the most damaging was related to Dillian, Senua's dead lover and the central secondary character of the story. He is the man Senua walks through hell to redeem, but I found his writing particularly perplexing. He speaks about seeing beyond Senua with darkness to who she really is and about the shape of life being defined by the things you love not the things you lose. However these messages aren't really delivered with his character or relationship to Senua in mind. For example this moment with Dillian here is him explaining that Senua's father can't see past her darkness but that he can and that the darkness is just one part of the person that he loves. He says this verbatim without subtlety or character. I have just quoted his dialogue. A better way to demonstrate that he sees and values Senua for who she really is beyond her darkness would be to display it. For this moment, ignore it and talk about something else. Maybe they have some light-hearted banter about something completely irrelevant that happened that day, and it's a nice little memory of her time with Dillian that Senua holds onto when her darkness was completely out of the picture and she felt so loved by this man. To convey that Dillian doesn't define Senua by her darkness, he needs to occasionally, you know, talk to her about other things. This particular message is completely contradicted by the delivery and in doing so makes Senua's character appear weaker too. If even Dillian keeps talking about her darkness, what else about her does the player have to grasp? She largely is within the story defined by her trauma and by her love for Dillian. And outside of the story, the game was sold on the back of the same features. If you ask me, that's a pretty spectacular oversight. Dillian has relatively little character building himself and he only appears in these moments to lay down the messages at convenient times because the writing apparently has very little interest in offering up its morals within the guise of story, merely presenting them raw so the player can understand them as simply as possible. The people learn messages more fully from characters and their actions, their personalities, but Dillian does very little of note besides be murdered. So again, he's more of a means to an end, to disperse morals for people to hold on to and to act as a plot device rather than a character. You can't create characters with depth when the purposes they serve in the story are so overt. Same goes for Senua's father and mother, if they were giving character and motivations for putting forth what they mean. In place of this powerful subtlety driven by character, the game spoils and weakens its own arc and message by having Senua's mother say it fairly plainly as early as 35 minutes into the game. Your father cannot see what you see, but there is nothing wrong with seeing the world the way you do. Given how focused the game is on its cinema and story within it, I think it would be a shame not to devote some time to it. Despite its reliance on flashbacks and the non-linear story, the game's structure is quite smooth. When you look at the whole picture in sequence, it makes a lot of sense from a pacing standpoint. In short, there are a handful and a half of major moments throughout the game at the end of gameplay branches where things go down. Things like Senua meeting Dillian for the first time, confronting her father, finding Dillian's corpse in the destroyed village, being defeated by Hela, attempting suicide suicide with her broken sword, sacrificing herself and her rage to arrive at the acceptance of grief, conquering one of her inner demons like the haunting ghost of her father, a bunch of stuff. What do all these moments have in common with one another? Well first of all, they're all very important to the story. These are the moments that define Senua and her tale. While the narration throughout levels offers exposition or build up, these moments at the end of the branches are where things really come together. The most significant scenes of story, the most spectacular photography, the points of game that matter most to the whole picture. Your reward for getting to the end of a branch is a healthy chunk of story, a little break, and a moment of great importance to your character and consequently you as a player, capitalizing on what's led up to that moment and setting up where you'll go next. So the game has a fairly modern take on cutscene direction, very close up and deliberate. It's smooth, often single shot cutscenes were actually captured on a GoPro while Melina Jurgens performed the motion, sound, and facial capture of each scene live, and they often transfer back into gameplay rather smoothly, which is an 
incredibly important thing in games with a focus on presentation. This style of cutscene helps the player to feel as if they are an observer of Senua's, and it's successful in that intention to a ridiculous degree. Paired with the lead narrator, who openly acknowledges the player's presence throughout the entire game and through cutscenes, the player is usually always portrayed as an observer during the cutscenes. There are moments in the game where the camera takes the place of the other character in a conversation Senua is having, as if the player is standing in their place. At the very end of the game, before her exit, Senua apparently speaks to the player directly, leaving them to question if they were just another voice in her head the entire time. Here is the game's director on this particular style. Although we only have one camera and one camera operator, we felt we could use this to our advantage by having only continuous shots without cuts in the scene. And this gives a feeling that the viewer is an observer, like a presence, uh, watching Senua throughout. So it informs the style of the storytelling. Now here is one of the mental health advisors on the game's creative intention. Mental health hasn't always been presented in the media in a way that is particularly helpful. Um, it can be challenging to engage people with the subject matter and there are a lot of preconceived ideas about mental health and particularly schizophrenia and psychosis. So we hope our support allows the team to continue to collaborate with Paul Fletcher and with those who have experience of psychosis to create a game that provides a fresh perspective on the condition and allows audiences to engage with it in a way that just wouldn't be possible in any other medium. I am fully aware of what this game is trying to do. Like the man said, it would like to offer an experience of psychosis that is only possible in games and tell a powerful, engaging story through that lens that teaches people about psychosis in a helpful way. Because Senua is not an autonomous character at any moment other than those that matter most to the story, what the player can learn about psychosis from the most affecting sequences is not for the player to feel in this game, it is for the player to observe. The game can't really offer a true experience of psychosis because this cutscene and direction style has been implemented. Because the game often switches to the player observing rather than to interact with these most important moments, the value of the gameplay sequences, which is already damaged by repetition and normalcy, is called into question. The tangibility and consistency of the story's connection to the player, which is already damaged by a lack of a relatable setting or reality touchstone, is called into question. What they can learn about psychosis, which is already damaged by its scripted bluff nature, is called into question. The value of the story itself, which is damaged by the stringent, often uninteresting writing is called into question and suddenly we have a game that is not only in hot water because of the weight of its cutscenes over story but also because the intention of those cutscenes themselves runs against the form of the rest of the game in which the player is not an observer but a direct participant. There's a big difference between sympathy and empathy for characters and I'm not sure why this particular story opted for the former. I feel there's a lot more one can learn from these elements if the player themselves rather than the character is the focus of the delivery. There's no sense of of intimacy to it, no grit slipping under your skin when things get real. The combat feels great when it wants to, when it gets down and dirty it's a very effective system because it's engaging on both a visual and control level, because the player is the focus of the delivery of that system. But then comes a cutscene, which by its nature has the power to constrict a player's ability to engage, but then the player's role within the story is also shifted during that cutscene. Suddenly the story is aiming in a totally different direction, suddenly my place in relation to psychosis the thing I'm learning about is to watch it happen from a distance while directed at someone else. If it felt scripted and dismissible in gameplay, this is closer to a misfire. I do not believe Hellblade is a catastrophic failure, but from my point of view, the game's core creative intention to deliver an experience, not an exhibition of psychosis, is undermined from simply too many angles for me to call this experiment a true success. At the very least, it hasn't seen its full potential realized, and it's largely thanks to this single creative choice to make the player an observer during the most crucial moments of story when the gameplay does not also reflect that choice. If it did, if the player was an observer in gameplay, this would be a top-down dungeon crawler where Senua acts of her own accord from time to time, where the player fights AI who is also fighting to control her movement, and you must coax her away from traps to specific areas by picking the right prompts to appeal to her current emotions at one time or something. But that isn't the game. The game is a third-person action thriller with an over-the-shoulder camera. These are choices that scream atmosphere, scream viscerality, scream immersion and tension in the moment-to-moment, -moment, only to change to have 
have you sitting watching someone else react to the story events and make mistakes and you are asked to admire how lifelike she looks while doing so. Furthermore, in the vast majority of instances, the story events depicted in these cutscenes are not so far removed from the game's established mechanics to require a cutscene. Sometimes Senua is simply swinging her sword, or walking, or running and grasping at something, and I think the switch to no interactivity makes the gameplay seem useless. Not only does the change to cutscene not appear to be needed because the gameplay could also achieve these same functions, but the story moments depicted I think would be far more effective if the player was in control. When the gameplay also has excellent presentation anyway, I'm not sure these switches were necessary at all. I think that ethereal projections of bodies and the shapes of these other characters would be more than enough to replace this current cinematic choice in a satisfactory way. And that's already something the game does once or twice. These are recollections after all, it's not as though every character needs to be as detailed as Senua, but it sure beats exclusively non-interactive instances of interaction between Senua and the other characters. Given how important they are to the story, I'm surprised they're so absent in gameplay, because by all accounts, methods of character interaction within the world connects the players to the characters far more successfully. And for the rest of these non-interactive story moments, perhaps contextual inputs while preserving the cinematic style could be implemented. All it would take is a couple of extra seconds of interactivity and the player will feel instantly more involved in the story and more moved by its events, especially in this kind of tale. Having to push the stick to move the blade here would be earth shatteringly significant for a player and extremely effective storytelling. Needing to paddle or steer the boat here would be preferable so the game's atmosphere and Senua's apprehension are set up straight away. Walking closer to Dillian's sacrificed body as the mist clears, the true horror slowly dawns dawning on the player as they get closer and closer, feeling that silent dread as they approach. It's these little things like rolling the stick to let go of the head and then walking away from the ledge yourself, which make galaxies a difference in player reaction and story impact. This particular choice to make the player an observer, on top of the pedestrian isolated nature of the game itself, spells the end of this road for me. It seems that each of Hellblade's systems and its story delivery have been intentionally constructed to guide the player along certain paths to arrive at specific destinations in ways designed to elicit exact emotions. It feels as if it's trying to deliver a frustratingly precise experience and arc to every player who plays it so that people will cry at the right moments, smile at the right moments, exactly how the story intends, and I don't place much value in a game built this way. I think Hellblade does far too much to stop you from, ironically, making up your own mind. I think Hellblade is a game that held bucket loads of promise and potential but perhaps became too obsessed with itself and drew inward to the loss of heart separate from its premise. It features and focuses on important themes but I think it spent far too long congratulating itself for simply having them instead of using them to the best of their ability, even if it meant a game that was four hours shorter. I think the sacrifice would have been worth it. I, at almost no point, felt immersed in Senua's world and felt none of the effects the game had taken such pains to depict because I was watching them happen to somebody else and the money they saved on successfully motion capturing that person was, from all my external research, the focus of the entire project. In essence, Hellblade Senua's sacrifice does not connect to a player because it is more concerned with the story functioning correctly within itself. It is not reaching out. It is not enthralling the player. It is demanding that the player be enthralled.